Well, welcome back. We're going to finish uh, together this section in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, if you would join me uh, back there. If you remember, Paul last time is uh, boasting against his will and yet boasting to make a point against the boasters. They have been boasting about their supernatural or spiritual experiences, uh, trying to say that they're better than Paul, that they should really be a replacement for the apostle that Christ has chosen to reveal his gospel and his message to the world. And so Paul's been answering that, basically saying, hey, I, I've had supernatural experiences too, plenty of them, abundance of them, um, as is fitting, we'll see next time for an apostle of Jesus Christ, but you're missing the point. Basically, he says, I don't boast in those things. We saw that kind of distant boast. He said, I, I know a guy who experienced this, and he kind of distances himself from it. Well, let's look at the rest of this as we consider a little bit of the theology of the thorn, and you'll know what I'm talking about when we start reading, but let's pick up in verse 7, and notice the, the connection here. I received this great vision from the Lord, and he goes right into this. Verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, Paul's conclusion I most gladly will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches in needs and persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, what a statement from the Lord and what a response to the boasting of the false teachers. Paul's basic uh, argument here, statement or um, message to the Corinthians is this. They're boasting about all their spiritual experiences. But what I need you to understand is I've had those. There's nothing to boast about there. That doesn't say anything beautiful about me. What there is to boast about is this humbling that God brings in my life to keep these things from making me as prideful as these false teachers are to you. In other words, something is lacking in them of spiritual significance. So let's think about this very personal boast on limitation. As I said before, he, he distances himself from that <clears throat> vision. But here, notice the change in tone. I knew a guy who had a vision. But notice what he says here. Lest I should be exalted. A, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be... And he's just saying, this is clearly about me. The, the bragging part, I don't even want to talk about that about me. The humbling part, though, bring it on. This is about me. And, and if you want to boast, this is what you need to boast. About. Boast about how God has humbled you and kept you from pride and arrogance and waywardness. So I want us to think about this... Um, this thorn a little bit. A lot of questions about the thorn. I have questions about the thorn. Um, what is it? Everybody wants to know, what's the thorn? What's the thorn? Well, let's walk through it a little bit. First of all, he says it's a thorn in the flesh. So immediately, I think, some infirmity, some physical uh, problem. And surely enough, in Galatians, which is the next book over, chapter 4, verse 13, he says this, you know that because of physical infirmity, there's his word, infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. In other words, some physical problem had left him in Galatia, and while he was there, he preached the gospel to them. And he says, in my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject. So they didn't reject him because of this physical infirmity he was having. Um, for I bear witness, I'm sorry, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as a messenger of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing that you enjoyed? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. It's a lot of biblical, probably solid speculation that Paul's infirmity was a vision problem, a problem with his eyes, maybe a leftover from being blinded on the road to Damascus, seeing Christ, we don't know. It may have just been age-related or something else. But it does seem that he had a physical thorn, a problem in his flesh. But in another sense, Paul uses this word flesh a lot. 
And he's almost always referring to his sinful nature or to our sinful nature. Read Romans and see how many times he talks about the flesh as our old sinful nature, our old man. And so if Paul's talking about that kind of flesh, he could be talking about a temptation, a thorn in my old sinful nature that keeps rearing its head. Um, could have been talking about that. Later on, he says this uh, thorn was a messenger of Satan. A messenger is a personal title. A, a thing is not a messenger. A, a person is most often a messenger. So he could be talking about an, an enemy that Satan had sowed into his life that kept hindering him or causing a problem. But please listen. The point of this is this. This thorn is a nagging hindrance that pained Paul. He's not trying to detail to us the nature of the thorn. He's trying to remind us of the purpose of this thorn, which was to humble him. And I think it's left general here by the wisdom of God. If, if I said to you, the thorn in the flesh was without question an eye problem, it may be that several of you would say, yeah, I can, I can relate to that. If I told you it was another fleshly problem, it was cancer then a couple more of you may say, oh man, I can identify with that. If it was an adversary, a person who was hounding and dogging Paul everywhere he goes, a few more of you would say, preach, I, I, I get that, I've been there. But if, if I just say in keeping with what God has said that it was a thorn in the flesh, how many of you can relate to that? Every single one of us can relate to that. I love the wisdom of God and uh, just a reminder, Christian, that the best thing we can do is receive what God leaves as blank, leaves as questioned, is to receive it that way and trust in his purpose. Um, that has helped me with this issue of the thorn and with a lot of issues we just studied in Revelation in our church. So another question about the thorn, where is it from? Where did it come from? Who sent it? In one sense, it's a messenger of Satan. Satan sent this. The devil sent this to hinder Paul, to be a problem for Paul. He even says it was sent to buffet him and to hinder him, to beat him. Um, it's from Satan. In another sense, though, he says it was given to me with a noble purpose to do what? To keep him from being puffed up by his great supernatural experiences. So you think Satan had an intent there to humble Paul and make him more like Christ? No. Listen, Satan had a plan for this thorn, but God had a sovereign plan for this thorn. And that's a tension that we need to get used to in Scripture. We see that same tension with Job. Who harmed Job? Who took from Job? It was the devil who said, let me take this from him, and he'll curse you to your face, God. That was the devil's idea. It was the devil's plan. And yet we know clearly in Scripture, God had a, you know, the devil had a plan. God had a sovereign plan in Job's life. Remember, he was trying to purify Job. Read the end of that book. He was trying to clarify his glory, which was being attacked by the enemy, by Satan. Um, God had a sovereign purpose. We see the same thing with Jesus. Who was it working hard to get Jesus killed, crucified, removed from the earth? The Bible says the devil put it into the heart of Herod and Judas, both of them in their parts in betraying and turning Jesus over to be killed. And yet, boy, did God have a sovereign purpose hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born on this earth as a human being and God in one. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, God had purposed to lay on him the iniquity of us all. And so in Acts 2.23, it says Jesus being delivered, listen, by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. Um, there's some good theology, some great things to learn about this thorn. Let me share a few of them with you. First of all, what, where can we go with the thorns in our life, these things that hinder us and buffet us and, and cause us pain? We can go to the Lord about them. Three times, right? Three times Paul says, I went to the Lord about this. That, that word time doesn't mean, uh, doesn't imply that I went at breakfast and at lunch and supper that day. Doesn't imply I went Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week. 
Um, it is this word that speaks of seasons uh, of time. It means that Paul had, over three seasons of time, had really weighed in prayer, uh, weighed into prayer about this issue in his life. We can do the same thing. Uh, we need to do the same thing. Cast all of your cares on him, for he cares for you. We need to be doing that. An interesting thing here. Notice, who does Paul pray to? He says three times, I pleaded with the Lord. Who, who is Paul talking about? Who does Paul call Lord? He's talking about Jesus. And look at the answer to that prayer in verse 9. If your Bible is a red letter uh, Bible, which most of them are, it marks out the words that Christ spoke in red. And is sure enough, in verse 9, it is red where it says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Even in that same verse, Paul says, I boast in infirmities, therefore, so that the power of Christ may uh, dwell or rest on me. He's praying to Jesus. What a, what a statement of the deity of Christ here. When Paul's praying to the Lord, he's praying to Jesus, God the Son. Sometimes he's praying to God the Father. Who can we pray to? Pray to God the Father. Pray to God the Son. Pray to God the Holy Spirit. Um, interesting little note there. Another thing we learn about thorns, we learn that Satan's jabs are never without purpose from the sovereign God. Every swipe that Satan takes, takes at us is never without, always includes this sovereign purpose of God. Think of the, the worst thing to happen to you, the thing that you would say, surely it is meaningless suffering. No, it's not. No, it's not. What's, what's your thorn? Don't let it convince you that God has somehow abandoned you. He had not abandoned Job. He had not abandoned his son. He had not abandoned Paul. And in your thorn, in your difficulty, he has not abandoned you. Uh, there is always that sovereign purpose. And one of the things that should drive us to is this, this prayer. God, what would you work in me through this tough season of time, through this difficulty? A third thing uh, we learn here is we also learn what some of the purpose of difficulty in our life is. And I don't in any way want to suggest that I'm telling you that every difficulty in your life is only about these two things and never about anything else. But most of the time, we can count on it being about at least these two things. Difficulties in our life, number one, are there to humble us, to build into us this meekness and the humility of Christ. Paul said... I was given the abundance of revelation, and so that it would not make me prideful, I was given this thorn, the God being the giver of both of those things. In a sense, how intent God is in guarding our humility, in governing our pride. Think about Paul received this glorious um, call on the road to Damascus, and you remember how he, was, how he left Damascus? curled up in a little basket, dropped out of the window, lowered down the window of the wall. This glory and this humbling. Paul was given this incredible vision by God and what comes right on the heels of it, this incredible humbling uh, by God. God knows that pride is our greatest enemy and he is intent and committed to protect us from that enemy. Another purpose in the trials and the struggles in our life is this, the glory of God. Paul's weakness, Paul's infirmity in his flesh makes it clear that his great ministry was not because of his greatness. It was because of this incredible presence of God that sustains him, this incredible strength of God that far outweighs Paul's strength. Makes it clear that Paul is just a jar of clay, not a celebrity, not a guru. It's the power and the glory of God that sustains him. Him. How is God humbling you in your circumstances? It's to be boasted in. How is he glorying himself, glorifying himself? Whatever you and I go through that is to the glory of God, it's worth it. It's worth it. Our purpose is not to exalt ourselves. When we brag about our spiritual experiences, that's what we're trying to do. That is not our purpose. Our purpose is to expose the glory of God. So when we have this great endurance for the sake of the gospel, even through great difficulty, that is to the glory. That's how we glorify 
God. And again, we, we would need to look no further than the cross and to Jesus. When I think about his glory and I think about how he has laid all of that aside to come and to, to take on humanity and to take on suffering and to death and the death of the cross, he humbled himself. He embraced all of that humility. Why? For the glory of his Father and out of love for his people. That's, that's the example that Scripture lays in front of us. Um, I hope you and I can learn from that example. And I thank God for the example of the Apostle Paul, even when he's being called out as not good enough. Um, he is still humbling self and glorifying uh, the Father. May we do that this week as we go out and about in the world and love the people that God has put around us. Lost people, saved people, um, brothers, enemies. Uh, I had a guy this week say, will you please pray for my enemies for me? Wow. Uh, may, may we share in that. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, thank you for these examples. Uh, Lord Jesus, we pray to you just like Paul did. And we thank you for teaching us, um, teaching us the things that will help us to persevere like Paul, like you, Lord Jesus, in our difficulty. And it will keep our heads focused and our, our minds focused um, on the glory of our Father, the glory of our Savior, instead of trying to glorify ourselves. Would you bless uh, those in this hearing today? We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. See you back next week, chapter 13.